Union Selenauts, and welcome back to Flonus's Cellosphere. We are here in Munich, Germany, coming to the end of our two days of absolutely incredible coverage. My name is Savannah Peterson. I'm delighted to be joined by George Gilbert on this one. George. Great to be with you, Savannah. Your enthusiasm was so contagious this morning. Oh. I had to make sure that you got on this segment because our next guest is so cool. Carson, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. President of Salonis, for those who don't know, though I suspect you are a celebrity inside this room. How does it feel to be around the community this week? Uh, happy Stella now it's at work. I would say <laughs> that always feels good, and in particular being surrounded by so many customers and partners. It's actually, like, it's rewarding. It's, it's like, despite all the prep work and, and obviously also some tension before, it's like the biggest reward of the year. It's like it's like like premature Christmas or, or whatever. Like it's so happy, very happy. Yes, I can tell you, your your smile is, is contagious and radiating all the way over here on this side of the desk. I had the pleasure. Uh, well, so first of all, we've had Alex, we've had Will, we've had all of your VIPs. Just hats off to the entire community of people you have surrounded yourself with. They're brilliant. They're compelling. Your customers are glowing when they talk about you. It, it's pretty impressive, quite frankly. But one of the things that really struck me is I, I happened to serendipitously have dinner with one of your data scientists two nights ago, and he brought up a fact that I did not know about Salonis, which is there's no sector of your business that's more than 10% of your saturation, true. Yeah. meaning that you cross so many different verticals. Yeah. George and I come from the Silicon Valley. Tech people tend to design things just for tech companies or for a very narrow segment of the market. You had the vision to create a tool that would be tool agnostic, legacy system agnostic, and industry agnostic out the gate. How did you know to do that? What was the thinking when you were brainstorming and starting to architect this? I like to call it a platform, not a, not a, not a, not a tool, but that's a different story. Like, what was the thought process behind it? Like, when we when we started to think about how to apply object-centric process mining into something that really creates value for the customer, you automatically end up in a place where you have to flip the case-centric process-by-process model into something horizontal. And I'm not exactly sure if from second one we were driven by the motivation to do this industry and use case agnostic, but we were driven by the fact to make this incredible technology available to our customers. And then we obviously realized quite fast that this is not a vertical case-by-case -case operation anymore. It's actually creating a digital twin of our customers' operations. There was something, though, that I find really interesting, which is you talk about this, which, which sounds like a small technical shift from case-centric to object-centric, but that made it horizontal. And, you know, what Savannah was saying, when living in the Bay Area, all the companies that, you know, we're exposed to are basically tech companies selling to tech companies. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of this, you know, incestuous kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas <laughs> yes, what, what I find remarkable here is that you're selling business value in a very, very, you know, compelling way. And like I, I told you and I told the crew, I, I, it, it feels very much like SAP when it was taking off in America in the early 90s. They were selling, you know, deep business value, you know, but there was there was some deep technology underneath it. How did you how did you take both that that transition from the case centric to the object centric, and then like from tech centric to business centric? We have always been very focused on value, like even in the case centric world. Like okay. value was how we measured success with our customers. Yeah. And also if you look at adoption, if there's no value that actually could be operationalized on a certain yeah. level, you could not drive adoption further. So I think that was not different in, in, in okay. both worlds. But but obviously it was a little bit more sensitive coming with object centric or case centric in the process intelligence part is like one thing. Like right off the get go you show like issues also cross departmental, right, and yeah. across data domains, which is not always necessarily an easy exercise with, with our customers. And when we launched that product last year, you could see some initial speed bumps. But we learned how to deal with this, also like how can we articulate the value and what it really does for your organization driving yeah. this value. And then over time, the adoption really grew exponentially and, 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 and is still accelerating, right? We have about like, I think, 140 customers on the new model and another 250 in the making. 
and still going. So, this, and the other course. thing is like what's really anecdotal. Yeah. yeah. I can tell you that Silicon Valley companies are sending tech to tech. When I like moved to New York for Hybris, my old company, yeah. in 2009, like it was absolutely not accepted by my board of directors. They said if you want to be successful in North America, you have to go to the West Coast. My answer was why? High tech yeah. and media is the only two industries I don't sell to. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I went to New York. So Alex was actually, when he came to New York, he was in the, like in the first half year living out of my house. So we did the same thing, then together again. So that was actually also like one of the reasons why we ended up at the East Coast. It was customer focus and focus on our industry. Well, absolutely. And, and New York is basically, well, Americans would say at least the business epicenter of, of our universe in, in that capacity. I want to touch on something that you brought up in the beginning. And, and I, 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 I use the term tool loosely. You're right about platform. But I, but, but there's been an evolution mm -hmm. for Salonis in this category. You know, you started with an incredible focus on process mining. And, 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 and because of that laser focus, you've been able to build out what is now an intelligence platform. That's been, mm -hmm. that's been a big part of the whole week. How do you prioritize what to build next in that roadmap to expand that platform to continue to serve the incredibly diverse customer base mm -hmm. and, and, and attract the over 400 partners that you currently have today? Like, we are pretty much moving up the stack if you look at the announcements. Yeah. So, like, a lot of focus yesterday also on the keynote was on the silo cost, this incredible, like, data infrastructure that we had to build to host all that data and the complexity of that data. Yeah. And then once once you have that, like, how do you give the data context? Once you, once you have that, like, what can you feed with that? Which then goes from process intelligence and business context to improvement, monitor, mon monitoring, changing it, right? APIs, how can we make it available for third parties? And then you move up to the consumption layer. What do we need to do to make this easier for our customers and partners to consume and create their very own experiences with it? So that's how we think about it. Like mm -hmm. move up the stack and make sure at any given point in time it is scalable, it's robust, and it can actually frame enough value that it justifies the next step. So that's this, 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 this long dance in Silicon Valley of trying to establish uh, a very like horizontal platform with a certain set of, you know, narrow or vertical, I don't want to say vertical, but, you know, a set of use cases that drives the platform, and it's the interaction between the two that makes the, the platform more mature, but draws others onto that platform. How, yeah. how are you thinking about that? We literally took, took the effort and we visualized all potential yeah. use cases around core processes across all industries. We call it the seller stone. Like, this chart exists. It's like a crazy chart that shows you, I would say, about a thousand use cases in certain process domains, business domains, and across all industries. Yeah. And we thought about, okay, what do we focus on? And in which ways are we giving up the real estate so that third parties can actually build apps and assets on top of the platform and covering the other pieces of the real estate? Yeah. So it's really a completely programmatic approach, like very precise, very transparent, because that's the only way how you can drive a sustainable, successful ecosystem over time. Program, programmatic and precise, it sounds exactly like your platform and, and your solution. Uh, that surprised. sounds very charming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were, we were actually joking uh, as a production team how on time and well-oiled the machine has been here for us on our side. And it's like, duh, look at where we are. Of course, of course it's incredibly efficient and, and incredibly fun. When you are... You talked about a thousand use cases. Now, again, I, this is great. The reason Silicon Valley. I'm not hating on on home. I'm sorry. We love you, everybody at home. But but I, I it's always about narrow focus. Investors only want to put money into something that has a, a very identifiable market. Your Germany is the largest unicorn. Over 13 billion in, in valuation. It's pretty disruptive. Do you consider yourself disruptors internally, do you, or you just see yourself as, as wonderful problem solvers? We consider ourselves change makers. Yes. I, like at one at one point in time, look, and I've I've seen those examples. Like there used to be a lot of innovation over the decades, but at one point it was also very clear that processes got retrofitted into systems to fit. And um, on a certain level, it's, it's time to liberate the processes a little bit, right? And, um, the processes. I love that visual. That's great. <laughs> Process Independence Day. So, so, no, that's really, I think 
And why why is that? Like you used to have one system of record. Then you used to have a system of record and a leading system of engagement. That's also not the case anymore. You have more yeah. systems that really count. You have also more than one system of record most of the time and more than one system of engagement and a system of experience. So so by definition in today's landscape, uh, processes do not reside in one system anymore. So what's, what's the consequence? It also doesn't make sense to retrofit them to one system. Like you have to have an end-to-end -end process view, and you need to really do this end-to-end -end and think about what's the most efficient way of efficiency, but also ownership of, of that process. And ownership comes with people and with systems, right? I want to I pick up on that, because there's something, the, tech, the techie in me wants to ask this question where, you know, for 50 years we've been living with data in, in strings, you know, whether it's tables or, you know, NoSQL, JSON documents, we had to, I guess the technical term is change the type system right. to deal with processes. Help us understand um, the technical change and how then that changes how you can build applications that cross all the other applications. That's, you know, that the change in the technology allows a change in the application. Let's make a simple example and take take two systems. Let's take a system of record and a system of engagement, like an e-commerce system and, and an ERP system. If you take one of the most common processes order to cash, only that process spans from the system of record to the system of engagement, right? Take take B2B or B2C e-commerce, integrate into a ERP system. If a customer consigns two online inventories to complete an order and deliver that order, yeah. That event doesn't exist in the ERP system because the ERP system does not know to online inventories, right? Just a simple example. But at the same time, you have the same object that you can relate to, the order. Right. So you surface both and you take it on an abstraction layer so that the process makes sense and you feed the data from both systems because they have that abstraction. So just to recap, the old system know about these objects your new system makes a first-class citizen of the process, correct? And can change and can handle processes and variants of processes and analyze processes, which is a whole different technology stack, correct? And that's what's been missing. Correct. Okay. You can call it common business language or common process language, okay. but it is something like this. You can also call it connective tissue, like or cognitive tissue, even like yeah. if you think about the automation step afterwards. But but that's that's that's. And that's one of the six step changes. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. we've been straight jacketed for six decades. To a certain degree, at a certain point in time, it also depends heavily on whether the customer organization stand in terms of maturity. You don't, you, you don't feel the yeah. yeah. If you they may not realize that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. But building on, on constraints, straight jackets, liberating the processes. Yeah. Really, I love being with you, George. You always, you always take it in a really fun direction. Yanina yesterday said something really interesting, and it's very much a, a huge theme of the show, and I want to get your take on this, because as a technologist, as a Californian, as someone who actually lives oceanfront, the climate, sustainability, and our planet is very near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. Yanina was talking about how she tries to visualize always having the Earth literally sitting at the table as a decision maker. Mm -hmm. For folks that can't necessarily see the branding here who are watching from home, but there is a huge emphasis on sustainability. Earth is our future. Mars sucks. Who wants to be a billionaire? Yeah, Cross yeah. out, breathe clean air. Your, your design team absolutely knocked it out of the park for the record. It's been super compelling and fun. What made you elevate that conversation the most right now as a theme for Celosphere? It was very simple. Like I had a very exciting career at my own company, High Everest, and then SAP, and then built a really exciting portfolio of companies I invested into. Salonis, amongst one of those, right? So why did I change that? Like I always talked with Alex when I was on the board of directors about the products, and at one point we both realized like the incredible value and efficiency that we got out of the first large customers. And um, that's two small kids at home, and. When we understood the concept of the platform, I really got goosebumps. And I was like, oh my God, this might be a way how to really contribute to the chances of survival for, for our planet. Because if you make every process work, and if you actually get to those efficiency gains and, and value gains 
across the largest companies, you can really make a difference. You probably can also offset some of the energy consumption that AI is needing, right? You, you probably can, can, can contribute to um, like local CO2 goals. You probably can contribute to more compliance and transparency uh, in the supply chain. And, it's, and you see that impact almost within every customer that, that we are serving. And then the beautiful thing about why we elevated the message was, like literally a few weeks into the job when I was sitting in the office in Munich, like two cellonauts, that's how we call our employees, came up to my desk and showed me deployment of Salonis for the SOS children religion. And um, they were literally using it to show the journey of the children from foster families to children village to education, when did it work, when did it not work. And the guy was just telling me, oh, look, this is really amazing. We have like 700,000 like, records in there. And I was like, what? And then he was like, casually saying, and the beauty was like, with the war in Ukraine, like, yeah, the data set in Kiev got like, destroyed. Normally, they would have lost track. We could just redeploy. Of all the children yes. that were, that were yes. taken to Russia, yes. they have them? Yes. They have we the could, records. We could, re- we, could restore, we could restore them. And since that day, oh. since that day, I was sponsoring the project. We just had, like, the next iteration of the project. We took the loan now to actually show the donors the journey of their donation and what impact it has in a very, very programmatic, analytical way. It will change the way how NGOs can raise can raise money. That's that's when we changed the vision statement to make processes work for companies, from planet to people, companies, and the planet. That was the reason. I feel that in my heart as you say that. Quite frankly, it gave, it gave you goosebumps. It gave me goosebumps. We've heard a lot of those stories from your customers as well. I actually want to hang out here personally. You mentioned your family. This is a question that I asked Alex, Rudy, Will even played along with me on this one, so I'm super curious. Obviously, obsessed with process mining, process optimization. That's why we're sitting here. Also want to change the world, which which matters. It is so refreshing as someone sitting in this chair to hear you think about your solution as a way to change the world and also drive that business value so that other companies, the enterprise, will invest in that. What sort of processes in your life outside of Salonis have you optimized? You should see how my family runs. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear it. That's incredible. So, so, give us an example. When we go on vacation, my wife has to give me an Excel sheet before where I can see every vacation day in 15-minute increments and know what we are doing. <laughs> I did that once. <laughs> and then she clearly told me. Yeah. She was like, okay, I'm in charge. No more. Yeah. No more. But I did it once. Okay. Other true example was my wedding. Yeah. The wedding planners came and they showed us the concept and I said, that's not enough. And they asked, what do you mean? I said, I want like a journey for every persona at the wedding. I want at every yes. wedding day from the few of a three-year-old child, a one-year-old child, a solo person at the wedding. Yeah elderly people at the wedding. So they had to create those those experience journeys for so every cool. single persona. So I That's think it's very thing. natural that I ended up at Salonis, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, this is all making a, a lot of sense, Carson. I, I can see exactly what you're saying. Either that or, or, or being the administrator for the Swiss National Train Schedule. Oh, my God, yeah. That, <laughs> I mean, that doesn't need me. <laughs> 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 They're probably already using Salonis anyway, so, so we don't need to worry about that. But I think it's a really beautiful example because the platform and, and all of your customers, everything you're talking about, it's so thoughtful. What you're talking about there is being thoughtful. It's not just optimizing for us as technologists sitting here. There's so many other people in the world that, that all of these products touch, that all of these companies and partners are integrated with. And I, I just think that's really, it's honestly really compelling. Did the three-year-olds report back that they had a great time? <laughs> 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 they, had, they had happy faces on. So that's good. But what you said that is really interesting. Like one thing we always have to consider as a company and what we're doing, like is, is that empathy, right? Because mm-hmm. no matter how good we are, now, like like how incremental we provide innovation and how planned this is, like every customer is different, and on a certain level we're exposing something that could be done better. And someone's responsible for that. So we always have to come in with that type of like empathy and humbleness and, and, and do the right thing for the customer. It's not always easy, right? No, it's not always easy, but 
leading with empathy is what's going to change the world yeah. and continue to empower the change makers and the Salonauts working at your organization. All right, Carson, we could literally talk to you all day. I'm getting scolded for production for going a little too long right now, so I'm going to give you one final question. Okay. We're obviously coming back. I know George and I have had a blast, Rob as well, and the whole team. So we'll be here at Salisbury whether you like it or not next year, I think. We'll be here also, by the way. And this year, because we secured the menu, we can announce the date right after closing today. Oh, that's exciting. I actually heard it already. November 4th. Yeah. Woo! Yay! Awesome. Well, we look forward to coming back. So when we're here next time, what do you hope to be able to say then that you can't yet say today? Yeah. That's on the record, at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Directionally. Directionally, directionally, I would like to be able to include a tangible, measurable piece on partners in the keynote and have a partner on stage telling a similar success story to what um, John did yesterday with Alex in the keynote. Yeah. I think that's, that's something where we need to develop more muscle, where we probably had a little gap in the past, where we're catching up fast right now, but this is not something I would have done this year. But yeah, I would love to see that next year because you see how committed they are, and um, like, I still feel we have to also like justify and earn back like, the pre-commitment they gave us a little bit, and we're well on our way, but we can do better. So that's for next year. Always improving the process and the storytelling while you're at it. Carson, thank you so much for thank taking the time during this thank busy you. Thank you. week. George, what a joy, as always. Nice There's so much energy. I hope that all of you at home can feel all the energy that we have here in Munich, Germany. And the day two here at Salona Salisbury. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching The Cube, the leading source for enterprise tech news.